Um, uh, thank you all for being here. It would have been much nicer uh, to, of course, have this uh, in person. Uh, but uh, it's uh, at least something that we are finally uh, getting back uh, to a more social interaction after this very long lockdown. So uh, what I wanted to tell you about today uh, is some of the work that I've been doing in the recent years. Uh, and also um, we have this new working group at the Large Hadron Collider, which is focused on uh, the detection of long lived particles. So I wanted to tell you about this new interesting direction uh, that we are pursuing and why it might be uh, relevant for the search for new physics. So uh, let me let me start. Uh, so uh, here are the questions that I mainly uh, would like to answer in this talk. So first of all, of course, uh, since we are meeting each other after a long time, uh, the first question is, what have you been up to? So hopefully this talk will answer uh, a little bit of that. And the next question is always, has the LHC found something new? So the answer to that is yes, partially. So there are new measurements uh, in a couple of sectors that we don't fully understand. And so I will have some slides later in the talk uh, that have some comments about this, uh, uh, about uh, what is new, okay? Uh, however, it is also true that after the Higgs uh, discovery, there has been no big announcement of something new uh, from the LHC. So uh, the question we want to ask uh, is, did we actually miss something? Maybe there was something there that we could not see. And the answer to what, when this can happen is if you have something called long-lived particles, which are particles that uh, decay after traveling a little bit, okay? So we are going to talk about that here. Uh, so let me just uh, get right into uh, the physics of uh, what I want to talk about. Uh, so uh, the, this talk is titled uh, looking at dark sectors. So we want to look at dark matter production at the LHC. And there has been a very long uh, standing uh, uh, tradition of looking for dark matter at the LHC. And the idea is uh, very simple. So you start with uh, uh, the phenomenology of dark matter. And the idea is that you have some dark matter, which I denote by D here in the early universe, uh, which can interact with standard model particles via certain diagrams. So here are some schematic diagrams of what can happen. So you can either have two dark matter particles annihilating directly into standard model or a dark matter particle and something else together going into the standard model. And because of these, you can essentially design your LHC searches to reverse these diagrams and produce dark matter by just going from the standard model, which is from proton collision to dark matter. The reason I wanted to show this slide first is because it tells us what the traditional signatures of dark matter have been. So since dark matter is not interacting uh, with the material in the detector, what you have is uh, a missing energy signature, which is essentially if you sum up the momentum uh, of all the particles, the momentum does not sum up uh, to, uh, to zero. So if you look at a transverse direction in the detector, I will explain a bit more in, in a bit, uh, but uh, you would expect that the momentum sums to zero, but it does not. And that is how you traditionally try to look for these. Uh, these invisible particles. However, uh, the, uh, what has happened so far is that all of the searches that have been performed either in direct detection experiments or at the LHC, so you look at this missing energy searches or this recoil against an invisible particle, and all of these have found answers that are exactly as expected from the standard model. So nothing new has been seen. So this is what I was talking about. So I also wanted to show this plot, which is slightly old, but what this plot shows is uh, a summary of direct detection experiments for dark matter, uh, where you can see what kind of uh, cross-section of this dark matter or WIMP is expected with nucleons in the detector material for different masses. And the reason I wanted to show this plot is to show you this uh, gray region, which is the predicted region where uh, all of our theories so far of dark matter said uh, that you would see something. So you, know, you would either see something in this direct detection or at the LHC, and the answer is that we haven't seen anything so far. So what might we have been missing? So, uh, so now we can talk a little bit more in the details of, uh, of these diagrams that I was showing you. So why does dark matter predict long-lived particles at all? So the original idea was uh, was this simple idea where you have uh, in the early universe dark matter in equilibrium with the standard model. 
as the universe expands, you have uh, the dark matter going to standard model still there, but the opposite process falls out of equilibrium. And finally, you have the dark matter density freezing out. So this was written down in the 1970s and is called thermal freeze out. Uh, and since then, there have been many mechanisms of getting the right dark matter density that have been written down. So this uh, field has been explored more and more. And by the 2020s, we are now at a stage where you think of uh, uh, this calculation more in terms of a sort of a phase diagram. So just uh, looking at certain couplings, you can uh, switch between different kinds of mechanisms of getting the right dark matter density. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about what these particular mechanisms are in a minute. Uh, Nishita, yes. can I ask a night question? Yes. Uh, so when you say all the theories say that it should be in this region, uh, yeah, these are these these are Within the supersymmetric theories, or I mean, yeah. So these are mainly so super. This big blob is mainly from supersymmetry, uh, but that is a, a very good indication uh, in general because supersymmetry, remember, has partners that are uh, SU two uh, that have both SU two and U one charges. So basically, anything that has weak charges can be well well represented by this. So it's not uh, a very outlandish idea. But yes, so this this blob is supersymmetric. Okay, thank you. Okay, so yeah, all right. So all right. So the first uh, first uh, sort of new idea that I want to tell you about is this idea of co-scattering, where uh, this original idea of dark matter going to standard model either directly or by co-annihilation, uh, both of them don't work anymore. So both of these cross sections are way too small to get you the right dark matter density. Uh, but what happens instead is that dark matter scatters with a normal standard model particle to this what we now will now call a mediator particle and the mediator particle has very strong couplings with the standard model and annihilates very efficiently okay, so this is sort of a uh, uh, a two-step process okay that happens and in this case uh, because this coupling is very small this uh, dark matter mediator and standard model coupling is very small which is what was responsible for killing these diagrams uh, it also naturally implies that this mediator particle uh, has, a uh, has a small width and is therefore long lived. So the way you would try to probe this kind of scenario is by producing these mediator particles and then waiting till they decay and they will decay again by the same diagram into standard model and some invisible particle. Okay. Another thing to note here is that if you have uh, dark matter explained by such a model, then colliders are the only ways to look for them because these guys uh, do not really interact with the material in the detector uh, fast enough or rather strongly enough for us to see something in direct detection searches. So you would only... Nishita, just to clarify, so when you say long live, what is the time scale you are thinking about here? Uh, yeah, so the time scales, uh, so, uh, so since we are, uh, we are working with uh, LHC detectors, uh, what we all long live is something that will uh, decay after traveling at least 0 0.1 uh, millimeter because that is the minimum distance that you can differentiate. So that uh, translates into a width of 10 to the minus 13 GeV. So that is uh, how we define long lived essentially. And you can also do it uh, in, uh, in, in seconds. So it will be in some picoseconds, a few picoseconds would be the lifetime. So it's still very short if you think of it in, in our normal human time scales, but that's what's long lived for the LHC. Uh, Vishita? Yeah. Uh, this co scattering dark matter scenario, does it revive uh, some of the parameter space that you showed was ruled out in the earlier slide? Uh, so, you mean this one? Yeah. Uh -huh. So, it won't actually even appear here because the WIMP nucleon cross section is very, very small. So, you won't be able to see it on this at all. It will be far below. It will be far below. So what you're reviving essentially, uh, so so uh, you should think of it more in terms of uh, discovering new new parameter space that was previously thought to be unfeasible. Okay, so that was uh, yeah, so that was uh, the idea of post scattering. The other yes, uh, uh, yes, yeah. one more question. Yeah, if you go to that dark matter uh, parameter slide, mm -hmm. so of course normally it is said that uh, no. On the lower side, there is this neutrino floor because neutrons mm -hmm. have to yeah. be seen. Yeah. Yeah. 
now yeah so does this mean that in this uh, co-scattering um, idea you can actually go below the neutrino floor also because uh, so uh, uh sections right so the examples that we've studied actually are still in the wimp mass region so we are still in this mass region but of course you are much much lower than the neutrino floor here uh if you ask can you design a model that is somewhere here uh I would say that we haven't looked explicitly at this, mm -hmm. but I don't see any uh, any specific reason why this should not happen. So oh, you so can my, possibly, yeah. My question is, huh. in the generic such scenario, since mm -hmm. you said that the cross-section is much smaller, uh, these particles will not be seen at uh, a direct dark matter detection experiment. So no, you will see neutrino. Yes, that's yeah, the okay, right one. Right. Okay. Yeah. So in fact, so that's uh, so that was the point that I was uh, trying to make, uh, which is that you can see these only at colliders. You will not see them in traditional dark matter searches okay, fine. at all. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So then, uh, other mechanism that uh, is also fairly recent. So it's still now it's now uh, over a decade old, but it's only recently been started. Uh, people have started studying it uh, properly. Is this idea of freezing, which was first given in this paper here? And the idea there is, so previously we started with uh, a dark matter at equilibrium and then whatever happens, happens. But suppose you can start with zero dark matter density in the early universe, and then you populate this uh, dark matter density later on. Okay. So the idea is in the early universe, you only have these mediator particles, which because this interaction is quite strong, get frozen out to a very, very, very small density. And then over time later on, you sort of recover the dark matter either by decay of this mediator or because this mediator interacts with standard model and produces this dark matter. Particle. So this is a, a different, again, a different way of producing dark matter. And this is a non-thermal way of producing dark matter. And uh, also, Nishita, for, yes. I had one question, uh, yeah. like is any, like are the mediators kind of completely unconstrained or are there, something about because you're already saying they're long-lived particles i'm just wondering mm -hmm. if you would directly see the mediators rather than just a missing energy in some of your yeah is there a way to see them yeah yeah so is that's uh, what i will hope i hope to address in my talk so all of the different okay, ways okay. of seeing okay. these mediators okay, okay fine fine right. sure okay so yeah so again uh for this case uh, what you would produce at the lhc would be these mediator particles and because their interaction with these dark matter particles is very small, or in fact, the word that is traditionally used is feeble, uh, these mediators are again long lived. So you would see uh, either these mediators or their strange decays at the LHC. And again, like before, uh, you would be able to probe this scenario uh, pretty much only at colliders. There is no other way of looking at uh, these kinds of models. Okay. So, uh, so let's just make it a bit more concrete. What do I mean by long lifetime? So long lifetime generally means that the decay width is very, very small. Okay, And the way to get the decay width of a particle small is either that it has very small couplings to whatever it is decaying into, or it doesn't decay uh, directly, but via something, some other intermediate particle. So you have uh, uh, another uh, um, propagator in the middle. And that guy is heavy. And that causes a suppression uh, in the overall uh, probability of decay, overall uh, decay width. So uh, you can ask how heavy does this particle need to be? And in fact, it doesn't need to be that heavy at all. In the standard model, this already happens for uh, decays of uh, mesons that have B quarks in them. And the suppression there is about 5 GeV is the mass of the B quark, and 80 GeV is the mass of the W boson that acts as uh, this intermediate particle. Okay, so it doesn't have to be that large, uh, order 10 to 15 uh, difference is already big enough. Uh, the third way of getting the small width or, uh, or, uh, is via compressed spectrum. Uh, so this uh, typically happens if you have multiple particles that are very, very close together in mass. So uh, there is not a lot of phase space available for them to decay into. So these are three traditional ways of getting a long length particle. Uh, which we should keep in mind. And uh, finally, just uh, to, uh, to uh, reiterate about the question of how to produce these uh, long-lived particles. 
So either they have to have a standard model charge themselves, so either a color or electroweak charge so that they can be produced directly, or you can produce some other particle that then decays into this longer particle. So there are two ways of producing them as well. Okay. So, uh, so this is the reason I wanted to uh, show you this is to sort of um, uh, standardize a little bit of a dictionary that we will use uh, to, to talk about uh, the searches for these uh, mediated particles that I was just showing you. Okay. So there, there are a bunch of searches already going on at the LHC. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, the, the searches are named based on uh, what they look like in the detector. So uh, on the bottom right here, I have a schematic detector at the LHC. So the black dot at the rightmost corner, you can think of as the interaction point. Then you have a detector that is called the tracker, which is essentially a very fine detector and a charged particle hits all these fine points inside and you can reconstruct a track. So that is why it's called a tracker. Then you have two different kinds of calorimeters. There is called, there's the electro electromagnetic calorimeter and the hadron calorimeter. The electromagnetic calorimeter uh, stops photons and electrons and the hadronic calorimeter stops basically uh, most other things. So protons, neutrons, pions, whatever. Uh, hadronic things that come out. And finally, you have uh, these muon chambers at the outside, uh, which are uh, these fairly sparse detectors, which uh, essentially uh, are sort of like the tracker, and they uh, the muons will escape the calorimeter, so they will go all the way outside, and the muon, the muon tracker on the outside essentially uh, captures them at the very edges. So using these, you can classify all different kinds of particles, uh, and in particular, uh, if we have these uh, long-lived mediators, and some of them, for example, decay into muons a little bit later on, what that would look like would be something like this. Okay? So you have uh, the track of the muon, but it doesn't pass anymore from the interaction point at the center. So this displacement between uh, the track and the primary interaction vertex uh, is what makes it uh, makes us call it a displaced muon. So this is what it would look like. So these are displaced leptons. The next possibility is uh, where you have uh, an invisible particle that then decays in the middle of the tracker into multiple charged particles, for example. And the charged tracks of all of these particles can then be reconstructed back to a single point uh, to make a vertex. But that vertex, of course, doesn't uh, coincide with the interaction, the main uh, interaction point that you have. So this is what is called a displaced vertex. And finally, uh, if the particle decays far enough out into uh, the calorimeters, then you have no tracks at all. You just have some deposits in the calorimeters. Uh, so you can still make uh, uh, what we traditionally call jets. So jets is essentially clustering uh, uh, all the uh, energy deposits okay, uh, together. And these jets, uh, you can also, they're sometimes called displaced jets, but there are other words that are used like trackless jets or emerging jets or so on. Okay. So this is, uh, these are some of the signatures uh, that can happen. And finally, uh, you can have a case where uh, the particle that you produce is charged in itself. Uh, so it is produced from the interaction vertex. Uh, but it's uh, an unusual particle, right? It's not a normal muon, it is a heavy particle. So the charge track looks slightly different in that the particle moves a bit slower. So the boost is a bit smaller than what we traditionally expected for muons, which move at pretty much the speed of light. And secondly, the bending is a bit smaller. So all of this whole detector is placed uh, in a magnetic field. So the bending depends also on the mass of the particle and the charge and the momentum. So. Uh, so, yeah, so essentially, uh, so that would be uh, another difference. And finally, if you have this charged particle that does not, uh, is not so long lived that it goes all the way out to the muon chambers, but it uh, decays beforehand, then you have a, a, a sort of midway signature, what is called a disappearing track, which sounds exactly like uh, uh, exactly that, that's a track that suddenly disappears. So this is the vocabulary of uh, signatures that uh, we will use to understand how these mediators can look like. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'll just pause and ask uh, if this was, uh, if there were any questions here. Okay. 
All right, so these, uh, these, that was the vocabulary. And then uh, we are now in a place where we can sort of systematize all kinds of dark matter searches going on at the LHC. So uh, I've chosen to systematize them based on what kind of underlying idea determines the dark matterness of this, uh, of this model. So if you have the traditional freeze out model, then you have only the invisible particle or invisible particle associated with some extra standard model particle that has been produced. And then there have been these standard searches with jets plus met or missing energy or invisible particle that is that are going on. So you can have jets, leptons or some gauge bosons together. And then you have all of these new uh, displaced sort of searches that have now come into the market. Uh, once we started talking about long lived particles that have been predicted either by scattering or freezing. And finally, uh, you can think of uh, the idea that uh, dark matter itself is some extra composite theory that uh, we don't yet know. And then, in, so I will talk about this more in detail later on, but in that case also you will have some uh, uh, extra signatures that look uh, similar to all these long lived particle signatures. So, uh, yeah, so, so uh, okay. So what I wanted to tell you here is that there are many different specific signatures that are possible at the LHC. And if you write a new theory that uh, does this, does the di right, right dark matter uh, density calculation, how do you test whether it is visible at the LHC or not? Okay. So, uh, uh, so Nishita, yeah. your, your map indicated that if you have some hidden gate symmetries, Hmm. And you will not get a heavy track signature. Is, is that uh, easy to okay. see? Uh, so normally, okay. So uh, so we will talk about this in detail uh, later on when we give an example of what this means. But uh, the idea is, uh, it, it is easy to see in the following way. So the hidden gate symmetry means that you need some sort of a portal connection between the hidden sector and the standard mod, uh, and our visible sector, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And because this hidden guy is hidden, it cannot be electrically charged. Okay. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so that already takes care yeah. of the fact that it's not. Uh, I mean, there's no obvious charge. Right. Sure. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. So, uh, yeah. So the question was that if you write a new theory that gives you the right dark matter density. I have a question about your previous uh, slide. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of related. Uh, first of all. Uh, these some of these search strategies don't have to do with the underlying idea, right? Because they have been utilized sure. before. Okay. So what's uh, exactly new here? I suppose you'll be telling us. Yeah. So so first of all, uh, so first I wanted to address the comment that. Uh, so what I wanted to do here was uh, to organize searches. Uh, taking into account the idea that we are looking for dark matter. So that is why it has been organized in this way. And secondly, what is new uh, here? Uh, so there are um, many small new things. So first of all, uh, these displaced searches are fairly new. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, I mean, so, so all of these are, are new here, right? I mean, I'm not sure what, uh, I'm not sure what else uh, what else to say. All of this is new. Hidden gate symmetries would always have given rise to some things of this kind. Yes, but um, we have not studied uh, the exact signatures of hidden gate symmetries at the LHC. In fact, we still don't know how to do that. So there have been certain ideas that have been floated, but nobody has done uh, even a half systematic job of understanding what that means. So yeah, so I will I will tell you. In fact, I will tell you explicitly what uh, the the blocks are to understanding this, and uh, what needs to be done, and what the working group is actually doing right now to actually make it more complete. Um, okay, so yeah, so uh, sorry if I didn't answer your question well enough, but hopefully we can come back to it to, at the end of the talk, and then then you know what is new uh, a bit more concretely. Uh, all right, so. Uh, so yeah, so the question that I was asking next was, um, uh, so you write down your own theory, uh, how do you check whether it is visible at the LHC or not? 
Uh, and what you need to do here is to have some way of essentially running this experimental machinery on your own theory. So normally uh, what you can do as a theorist or a phenomenologist is that you have Monte Carlo simulation of your theory, and then you need some sort of detector simulation and cuts and so on uh, to test, to reproduce what the experiments are doing and to test uh, the, uh, the consequences of your theory at a realistic experimental search. So since nobody wants to do this every single time by themselves, uh, there are, uh, we have these programs and one of them that I'm part of uh, is called Checkmate. And there is a new Checkmate version out now, uh, and it is the only program that is currently available that does these LLP searches uh, in a consistent way. So we have the five main searches that are already implemented and more are ongoing. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's in there and uh, you can test out uh, this checkmate machinery uh, using two. So I want to illustrate this using two very simple scenarios. Uh, so I want to cho uh, choose two uh, models of long lived particles based on what kind of charges they have. So the first model will have only U1 charge and the second model will have both U1 and SU3 charge. That's the QCD color charge. So the first model that you can think of uh, is pretty much the simplest uh, one. So you have a charge scalar and a singlet fermion that is uh, sort of like dark matter. And then you can write down, write down a coupling that looks like this Yukawa coupling between the scalar, uh, a, a lepton of the standard model, a right-handed lepton, and this uh, dark matter uh, particle card. Uh, and because uh, this new scalar is uh, charged, you can produce it by a trillion production. And because it is long lived, it will decay via one of these signatures. And because it has connections to this uh, lepton, you would typically expect uh, a displaced lepton signature. Okay? So you can uh, use these searches uh, implemented in Checkmate to see what kind of coupling regimes and lifetime regimes you are covered in. So uh, let's look at the lifetime plot first. So you can see that uh, these short life scale lifetimes are all uh, very nicely covered by the uh, CMS displaced lepton search for a wide range of uh, masses of this new file. And then if it is very long lived, again, you have a very nice coverage in mass from uh, the charge track search. So you have a charge that track that goes all the way outside. And there is an obvious gap in the middle where the charge track doesn't go all the way outside. And uh, also the lepton is uh, uh, too displaced to be seen in this search. So there are certain criteria that need to be followed. And this gap can be filled by, uh, in principle, by uh, looking for, for example, king tracks. So there are already these disappearing track searches that look for halfway going, uh, the tracks that go halfway through the tracker. Uh, but uh, uh, it throws away events that may have leptons in them. So this model is not visible in the dis uh, disappearing track search for that reason. So if you can design a new search with king tracks, then you will also fill this gap. So I wanted to show you this because it's an example of what kind of things are currently not possible and should be possible soon uh, with some uh, minimum modifications. So Dushita, yeah. so what, what is the reason that the, the range covered by CMS and Atlas seems to be mm -hmm. non-overlapping. I mean, they are kind of similar detectors. I would have expected maybe yeah, less yeah. more, but not non-overlapping. Yeah, so these are actually very different searches. So the this uh, the orange thing is the displaced lepton search, uh, which looks at uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, just leptons that have, been, that have come out and you have just extrapolated the lepton track, whereas the the Atlas search that is shown here is the heavy charge particle search, which is where phi is uh, long lived enough to go all the way out. So that is the reason for the gap. It doesn't have to do with Atlas and CMS. It's mm -hmm. just uh, the two searches that we chose. Were, so when we were writing this, the Atlas displaced lepton search was not yet public. So, so if, if I understand correctly, if we, even if we did uh, the other way around, you would also get similar curves. Yes, and, yes. And the gap is essentially between the the, what a heavy charge particle searches versus the the left on search. searches. Yes, exactly. So it's not it doesn't have to do with the experiment. It has to do with the kind of search that you're doing. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So yeah. Okay. So now I want to go to the second example where your uh, long lived particle is not just charged under uh, the U1, uh, but also under uh, the 
uh, under QCD. Okay, so uh, this. Uh, so the example that we chose here, so these kinds of things uh, were uh, quite common when, uh, in SUSY as well. So in supersymmetry, you have uh, color scalars and you can write down a, a coupling. So for those of you who might know, so this is typical of R parity wilding uh, scenarios, but you don't have to go to, to SUSY. You can just start with a color scalar and you can write down a coupling between uh, using a, a quark doublet and a lepton doublet that satisfies all your uh, all your requirements of uh, uh, yeah, essentially yeah. Uh, it's invariant under gauge and it, it has the light right uh, Lorentz structure and so on. Uh, so the idea here is that this uh, strongly charged guy can be produced at the LHC copiously uh, and then it decays into a quark and a lepton. And this quark, of course, then showers and hadronizes in the standard way. So you have a jet coming from this uh, this person. Uh, but of course, uh, since it's coming a little way off in the detector, you have these displaced vertices coming from here. Uh, so there are two different kinds of searches that can search for, for this kind of model. So you have displaced vertex plus missing energy or displaced vertex plus muons because you might have a muon from, coming from here. And both of these searches uh, give you certain limits on the mass and the lifetime of this particle. And similarly, you can also interpret it uh, on the mass and the coupling that is uh, giving you this interaction. So the coupling is traditionally denoted by this lambda prime. And these two, two, three refers to the generations of the fermions that are involved. So the, this two uh, refers to this muon, which is second generation lepton. This two refers to this uh, charm, which is second generation quark, and the three refers to the flavor of the initial guy, which we chose here to be like the B. Okay, so uh, so that's uh, again it gives you pretty strong powers. And another thing uh, to notice again is that the LLP search actually gives you a much stronger bound than the normal SUSY search, which is shown in this uh, uh, green line here. Okay, so. So this, these were uh, essentially two examples. So what I wanted to show you here is that uh, as long as you have some sort of charge for this LLP, uh, you should be able to detect it at the LHC. And we have certain uh, researches implemented uh, in Checkmate to, to allow you to do so. Uh, so these uh, different kinds of LLP searches are complementary for all different kinds of models. So, uh, so this is one one study that we did for the free, uh, freezing model uh, uh, a couple years ago. So the model is very similar to the first model that I showed you, except in this case, uh, the dark matter was a scalar and then you have a new vector like fermion. So I won't go into the details of this model, but I just wanted to highlight that this complementarity of charged tracks, disappearing tracks and displaced leptons happens uh, in, in multiple cases and you can apply them uh, in all sorts of uh, models. So I will tell you about two more dark matter models uh, that can give you uh, these LLPs. Uh, and this is a concrete example of the co-scattering idea. Yeah, just a simple question uh, yeah. in the previous plot. Yeah. You were showing that no, the previous one. Yeah. So the green line is the normal searches that people have been doing until now. Uh, so, yeah. so, uh, so the green line is, oh, sorry. The green line are the traditional SUSY searches for this uh, S bottom or the bottom scalar. So my question is that if this something was actually there, then the normal search would also have detected it. You, have, you would have probably have got uh, inferred wrong parameters of it, but you would have detected something. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so what these lines are, are actually limits. So uh, what that tells you. You are so coming from similar parameter space. You would have gotten a, if you, you know, in fact, so these are upper limits. Suppose yeah, these you are detected something, if something yeah. was there, then this normal search would also have picked it up. Yeah, so for example, you can think of it in this way. So if you have a 1500 uh, uh, mass of this S bottom, then you cannot detect it in the normal search, but it would still be visible in this uh, in this lifetime range in this displaced vertex search. No, my question was something different. That's yeah, yeah, sure, okay. sure. Yeah, you can okay. see them in yeah, both. Have detected it. You can see them in both. Yes, you're right. But sometimes, so big, but the standard searches have a larger background from standard model. So sometimes it helps to go into the long-lived searches. But yes, you're right. You can detect them in multiple ways. Okay, so you're saying that the sense, you are improving the sensitivity in these new searches? 
compared yes. to the previous search, you have higher. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, a question. Hmm. Uh, but uh, uh, isn't uh, the parameter searches are actually different, right? I mean, like for your standard search, uh, the lifetime is a constant. It's not a variable at all. It's, it's prompt. prompt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah, yeah. You probably would have, like, uh, let's say, if you were throwing away data which was not meeting at the colliding point, mm -hmm. then you wouldn't have discovered that in the standard search at all. Yeah, so that is kind of a dicey question that has not been fully an uh, answered. So there is uh, there's a plot. Uh, I think a couple of slides from now, uh, where you have this overlap between uh, the prompt and the uh, the displaced and how it changes. So, so you're right, uh, but the sensitivity is not necessarily zero. So, so that's that's the short answer. So, if you have so, so, so there are two reasons for this, right? So, remember, anything that has a lifetime uh, goes by exponential decay, and remember, the exponential decay always has a maximum at zero. Right. Mm -hmm. So that means even though it has a large proper lifetime, there is going to be a fraction of these guys that are going to de decay very fast. So I you're going it. to have some of them that look still look prompt. So that is one thing. Uh, and secondly, uh, yeah. So what what is visible and what is invisible is not entire entirely clear. So sorry for my for my hand wavy answer. I can make it more concrete. But what I simply mean is that uh, let's talk about a lepton in particular. So a lepton is identified as a lepton as long as it does certain X things. And it is not always clear that uh, all displaced guys uh, will either do those things or always will not do those things. So something like this. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So, okay. Let's go to the two um, explicit models that we have. Uh, so this is a model of co-scattering, some of some very simple model that you can write. And here the idea is that you are adding two fermions to the standard model. One of them is a singlet and one of them is a triplet of SU2. Uh, and the triplet guy is heavier than the singlet. Uh, the triplet, remember, has uh, more than one state. So there's a charged state and a neutral state. And the neutral state of the triplet mixes with the neutral singlet to give you uh, this kind of heavy and light uh, splitting of uh, two neutral uh, mass eigenstates. Okay? Uh, so what you would produce at the LHC is the mediator, which in this case is the charge uh, part of this triplet. Uh, and this mediator then decays via one of two ways. So either it decays to this light state, which is down here, which is mostly like the, the psi one here. And then it decays via an off shell W. And it is long lived because this mixing between the triplet and the singlet is small, so the coupling is small. The second way of this uh, uh, this charge guy decaying is it decays to the state that is close to it. Oops. Uh, and in this case, uh, the coupling is still uh, large. The coupling is pretty much the gauge coupling, but uh, because you have extreme compression in mass, you don't have enough phase space for the decay to proceed. So it is long lived because of compression. So the, so no matter uh, which decay it goes, the width is small in both cases and the particle is long lived. Okay, so this is one model. Uh, second model that's very similar to the one we discussed before uh, uh, was using this idea of minimal dark matter, which is asking uh, if you could add just one field to the standard model, would it be, would it give you a stable neutral guy? Okay, so the idea was that you could add a five plex, so like a like a doublet triplet, you could add a five plex, and uh, the neutral component of that is naturally stable. Uh, however, if you have this mixing with singlet idea of also of this five plex, then you have uh, these multiple states like before, except that now you also have this doubly charged new particle, and uh, you again have this kind of uh, 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 long lived. Uh, decay of this doubly charged particle, mainly because of compression. So it decays only to the singly charged guy and it is extremely compressed. So uh, both of these were uh, concrete models that we wrote down. And in both of these cases, uh, the, the decay occurs in the following way. So you have a W star or an offshell W, which decays into a lepton, and therefore it can give you a displaced lepton signature. Or it decays uh, maybe something like this, and then you have also some maybe displaced vertices or so on. Okay, so these are the, uh, the, the searches that you can look for. Okay. Uh, 
So since uh, all of these were looking at these displaced uh, lepton searches, uh, I want to talk about that one a little bit more in detail. Okay, so we looked at the uh, the displaced lepton search that currently exi that existed uh, at the time. So this was this uh, CMS displaced lepton search, and what this search does is it looks for one electron and one muon, and both of them have a large displacement from the interaction point. So this is the displacement from the interaction point uh, in the transverse direction. So that is called this D zero parameter. And the signals region you essentially choose are things that have a large displacement from uh, the interaction point. Uh, the other requirement uh, that this search does is that there should be some minimum energy that is carried by this lepton. So the this search has been uh, done at two different LHC running energies, so 8 TV and 13 TV. And there are these different energy requirements that have been placed at these searches. So at the ATV search, it's a requirement of 20. At 13, it is a requirement of 40. So we wanted to ask if this search can actually catch one of these models that we want to look for. Okay. Uh, and the answer, unfortunately, is that the 13 TV search cannot see them at all. So the current run at the LHC. And the reason for that is simply having this very high PT requirement. So uh, this plot here on the right essentially uh, shows you what happens uh, uh, to the sensitivity of your model once you change this uh, mass splitting between the heavy and the light states, between the mediator and the dark matter guy. Uh, the thing that uh, uh, I should also say is that this mechanism that you've chosen for getting the right dark matter relic density also determines the splitting between these states. So it's only certain combinations of splitting and coupling that work, not all combinations work. So we wanted to ask whether this search actually catches uh, the interesting models, uh, which give you realistic dark matter density. Okay, so this plot uh, shows you on the y-axis is the ratio of how many events uh, you get from your model to what has been ruled out. So that's the 95% confidence level ratio. And on the y-axis is the lifetime, okay? So originally this 8TV search uh, gives you this very large exclusion. So basically you rule out everything that has a lifetime between uh, something 0 0.05 or so and uh, almost a meter, okay? But as soon as the uh, splitting between your charged and neutral guy becomes smaller and smaller, your search starts losing sensitivity. You are uh, sensitive to smaller and smaller lifetime gaps. And by the time you reach essentially 20, you have no sensitivity at all. Now this 20 is particularly uh, important for us because so this example is uh, with charged mass of 220. And in fact, the examples that I showed you earlier predict uh, a 10% uh, mass gap. So that is uh, a, a natural prediction of these co-scattering or co-annihilation models that the mass uh, splitting between the heavy and the light state should be about 10% of the mass of the heavy state. So, uh, so that is kind of unfortunate uh, that you can't really see anything in these searches at all. So we asked uh, in this paper here whether we can do something about it. Okay? So I won't again go into the details of, uh, of the dedicated search, uh, but uh, I will give you uh, the overview of what we tried to do. So the main thing that was uh, the problem here, yeah, no, no, just I wanted to understand the, the 13 TV part inside this uh, inside this plot. What does that? Yeah, mean? so this is just a, 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 a just an overlay of a different search. So there's a disappearing track search, which could potentially detect this charged uh, track of 220 TV. Yeah, even though you, if you could not see it in the displaced lepton. So that was just uh, it only goes up to here. So that was what this yellow line was trying to show. The 13 TV part only. Uh, the yellow part is excluded or the white part is excluded? Uh, so everything below this line one is excluded. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you should see is where this exclusion line from the, dis uh, the displaced lepton search intersects this line of one. Mm -hmm. So it excludes between this and this, essentially, for, for this mass splitting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So the so the yellow part is just to uh, yeah. I did not talk about that, but it was just to uh, 
answer the doubts that somebody else might say, but you can see this in, in disappearing tracks. Uh, so that it was to answer that you can't really see everything in disappearing tracks. Uh, you still need the displaced left on search. Uh, okay, so yeah, so back to, uh, yeah, back to what I was saying. So, uh, so we, we basically, what we wanted to do was to uh, reduce this requirement of uh, high energy leptons that the experiment was placing. Uh, and the natural thing that happens when you remove this is that you have uh, a lot of background and so you have to change your cuts and so on uh, to be able to uh, get back your sensitivity. So there was a, uh, there was a bunch of things that we did and in particular we looked at uh, uh, designing a neural network that essentially probed uh, all different kinds of lifetimes uh, for a small splitting and basically you can recover uh, the entire range, uh, pretty much the entire range uh, of lifetimes uh, uh, that you had lost. Okay, so that was uh, so, uh, so that was uh, the overview from this. Uh, so you can do uh, so instead of using the lepton triggers uh, that was done before, you can use a missing energy trigger. But it would be even better if you design new triggers, uh, which are going to actually be done uh, be done at the new run three. So that was uh, what we concluded from here. Okay, uh, so uh, right. So I just want to talk a little bit about the the gap. So Triparna already asked the question about uh, this uh, overlap between uh, uh, the prompt and the displaced. And uh, so this is uh, an Atlas search, uh, of the Atlas the study that Atlas did, which they call RPV meets RPC. So it was only in context of SUSY, but you can think of it in terms of all long-lived guys. Uh, and so here is the idea where you have these uh, very stable long-lived particles, and these are the searches here. And then you have uh, these uh, uh, no, normal LP searches and this, this R parity conserving search for normal SUSY, which so, so this is their limit, about 2 TV. And you see that the limit degrades as you go to uh, smaller and smaller, uh, or or uh, as you go to longer lifetime. So it's not the same limit. Uh, it degrades, but it doesn't degrade to zero immediately. It degrades slowly. So that was uh, that answers that. Uh, but there are other things that happen. So between the limits from one search and then the other search switching on, there are some natural gaps that occur. Uh, and so these are, for example, uh, two gaps that you see in, in some of these uh, uh, searches. So there are searches for uh, this one lepton and zero lepton searches, and you have natural gaps in between them. So one obvious thing that you need to do is to design searches that cover these kinds of lifetime gaps. Another kind of gap uh, happens because of uh, specific requirements that the search is placed. So I showed you uh, what a displaced vertex looks like uh, in the in the cartoon figure. Uh, and uh, because you have these heavy mesons also in the standard model, we want to differentiate new particles from standard model mesons. And a quick way of doing that is by placing a requirement on the number of tracks that are in this vertex and uh, the total invariant mass of all the tracks that come from the vertex. So since the uh, background is essentially standard model, the heaviest quark in the standard model is the B. If you require that uh, the mass of the displaced vertex is more than 10 and the number of tracks is more than five, you basically get zero background from standard model. So this is what uh, the experiments did in the first iteration. However, if you have any new theory that has either Bs or Taus in them, then it naturally fails uh, this selection criteria, even if it is a new long-lived particle. And that is because the bees themselves uh, have a long lifetime, so it, you never really get five tracks at the end. And tau also only has three tracks at most. So this is again something that we suggested to the experiments that they change, and, and they are proposing to do that now for run three. So there are there are these gaps that you need to identify and communicate with the experiment so that uh, all possible theories will be covered. Okay. Uh, all right. So this is just a summary of uh, what we were what we saw so far. So there are many dark matter models that naturally predict long lived particles. There are different lifetimes that are possible, uh, and you need to consider many different searches to probe all different lifetimes and coupling ranges, and some gaps still remain and need to be fixed. 
Uh, all of these models, however, uh, were that of a fundamental particle that was the long depth one. Uh, what would happen if you have a composite particle like you have protons and neutrons in our visible sector? So two models like this exist. And uh, so there have been many models like this written down. And one particular case that I want to uh, talk about is this hidden valley model that was first written down in uh, 2006, a long time ago now. Uh, and the first realistic study at LHC was done by these people here in 2015. So the idea is that you produce somehow in, in some way these uh, dark, so what we are going to call them dark quarks now. So there's this new SUN sector and there are new quarks, the dark quarks that are charged under this SUN. And they, uh, uh, and it's a confining theory. So you have certain bound states uh, that form in the hidden sector as well. So the first search of this kind that has been done is this CMS search that I show you here. Uh, however, they use a kind of trick to be able to produce these uh, dark sector quarks, which is that they artificially use this uh, mediator particle that is charged under both uh, the dark side quantum numbers as well as standard QCD. Okay. So it's uh, if you know of leptoquark theories that are charged under both lepton and quark, so you can think of this as sort of a dark quark theory where it is charged under both the dark side and the quarks. So it's uh, something like that. And it has, uh, it's a trick that allows you to produce them copiously because they are charged under QCD and they will naturally decay into uh, the dark uh, sector as well. So the, it's, uh, it's useful as a phenomenological model, but perhaps not uh, very realistic uh, for, for, for uh, other physics reasons. But anyway, so there is this search and there are certain, uh, certain limits based on lifetime of uh, of the dark pions and and the mass of the mediator and so on so I, I won't go into the details of this search but i will talk a little bit about what can uh, make a realistic model uh, so uh, so so this is uh, some work that is uh, uh, ongoing so the idea here is that you want to have certain mediated particle that connects your dark sector with your standard model sector. And the two minimal things that you can think of is you have either a scalar mediator, so you might have some, uh, some scalar that gives mass to the dark quarks, and you can write portal couplings between this scalar and our standard model Higgs. So that is, this is what that would look like. Or you have a new Z prime. Uh, so, so there's no obvious reason for, for having this new Z prime. The scalar ostensibly exists at least to give mass to the dark side quarks. But you just have this new Z prime, uh, and then you have a kinetic mixing of this new Z prime with the standard model photon with the small mixing parameter. And then you can produce this Z prime, uh, and then it decays to dark quarks. So this could be two uh, possible minimal ways of coupling the dark sector to the standard model. So I won't be talking about the second one uh, so much uh, in this talk. So I'm just going to focus on the first one. Uh, Right. So what happens once you produce these dark quarks? So uh, just like QCD, they will emit radiation on the dark side, except this will be your dark gluon, not your standard model gluon. And you will have a uh, normal hadronization on the dark side as well to form whatever mesons and baryons. The baryons, so, so let's assume it's SU3 like QCD. So the baryons are stable because you have three quarks or three dark quarks that form them, but uh, if you have dark mesons, so they are sort of QQ bar types, so you can have again uh, a mediator uh, between the QQ bar on the dark side and the QQ bar on the visible side. Uh, so you may have cases where you have dark mesons decaying back into standard model mesons. Okay, so this is the signature that we are most interested in. Uh, because you have this heavy mediator going between the dark and the visible sector, you would expect your dark side mesons to have a large uh, lifetime before they decay back. Uh, all right. Uh, so, so when they do decay back into uh, charged standard model mesons, uh, you will get displaced vertices, uh, or some fraction of them will remain dark all the way out of the detector, and then you will have only a fraction of the energy visible in the detector, okay? So, uh, so the main thing that you should take away from this is that uh, this looks a bit weird. So you either have a jet that has no tracks because all of the dark mesons were invisible before they decay, uh, or you have the case where uh, 
you have uh, two jets that are coming out, uh, but they are not exactly equal and opposite in energy. So you have some missing energy, but the missing energy is also aligned exactly in the direction of one of the jets. Okay. So, uh, so both of these are weird situations. And in fact, the, one of the things that experimentalists do is, uh, to make sure that your missing energy is real missing energy and not from jet mismeasurement, it is actually required to have some minimum uh, uh, separation or rather, uh, uh, yeah, let's just call it separation, minimum separation from any of the jets. So that is one of the requirements. So it will fail this requirement. It will not look like real missing energy. So it looks uh, weird. It looks either like pile up. So it's, it looks like there is some neighboring collision that is causing some extra particles to show up in your event or it looks like mismeasurement. So we are uh, doing okay in that Pythia 8 can actually do the radiation simulation of the radiation with running couplings and everything and hadronization. But we still don't have uh, an interesting way of looking at these weird events. So there are some ideas uh, that are out there. The simplest idea is that you start, you uh, ask for one standard model QCD jet which is called the monojet signature. And this comes from the idea that you have quarks and gluons in the initial state anyway, uh, because you have a proton-proton collision machine. So you will have this initial state radiation. So you can always ask for an initial state jet and then try and see whatever weird thing happens. But however, this is not an ideal situation uh, because if, if you do even a very simple calculation, uh, you will see that, um, uh, uh, that you run into problems. So one of the things that uh, experiments need to do to ensure that they have a, a viable event rate uh, is that they use what are called triggers or thresholds for selecting what interesting events are. So there's lots of collisions happening all the time, but you only want to see few of them that are interesting. Okay, And this is done by using triggers. And uh, since there are so many QCD jets, uh, this monojet trigger is actually set at a very high number. Okay, so these are these are numbers from Atlas. The CMS numbers are not uh, fully public, so I'm just using the Atlas. But the CMS numbers should be pretty much identical. So for for a single jet uh, trigger, you can see that the uh, cut on the energy or the or the momentum of the jet is pretty high, about 400 GeV. And if you do a quick calculation, what, uh, how much suppression this causes. So if you have, uh, say, a Z plus a one jet, just normally having a 20 GV jet, which is standard, gives you this very high number of cross section, almost 2000 picobarns, but just requiring this one hard jet brings this down to 0.2 picobarns. So you have a suppression of 10 to the five. Okay. So, and this is, this is, of course, the goal of this, uh, uh, of this threshold or trigger. Uh, it is to reduce the QCD background. So this is not uh, going to be ideal because the QCD characteristic of our model doesn't change because all this extra jet comes mainly from uh, initial state radiation only. This would have been nice if you had a model where you had uh, colored particles in the final state because then you could have extra colored jets in the final state that would have easily satisfied this requirement. But it is not ideal for our case. So what can you do? Uh, so you can use other kinds of triggers. So here are some examples. So there is this uh, one uh, topology called the vector boson fusion topology, which is used uh, for Higgs searches where you have uh, two vector bosons, either W or Z, that fuse together to give the Higgs. And the uh, defining characteristic of this is that you have two jets that are very widely separated. Uh, and you can then use a much smaller, so this PT requirement was 400, but you can have a much smaller PT requirement along with a large separation requirement that uh, uh, allows you to see this. And similarly, because you have, uh, and also because you have a scalar which couples in proportion to the mass of the particle, so you can use top associated production. So the coupling to the top is going to be largest. So you can look at two examples with either TT bar or with a monotop, and you can look at production that way. So this is uh, just a quick test of uh, the scalar mediator model of how many events you would see uh, of this kind of uh, dark uh, sector if you had looked in one of these instead of uh, monojet signatures. You can see that for BBF and for small enough uh, uh, mediator masses, you can actually go up to 100 events easily. Okay, So, so this was, uh, uh, 
uh, one of the ideas that I wanted to put across is that you can uh, you have to think of new kinds of triggers to even look start looking for these dark sector models. So this is some uh, ongoing search. Uh, another thing that I want to put across to you is uh, is sort of a provocation, uh, uh, and that has to do with this new observation of uh, this four quark resonances that have been rec uh, recently seen. Okay, so you have these uh, tetra quark observations, either with four charm or these other guys here as well. And if you ask what decays of dark mesons would look like if you have a heavy mediator, uh, it would pretty much look uh, like you have a, a, a bound state of four quarks. Okay, so you would have a dark uh, guy that decays either to a pion pair or or a, or a B uh, hadron pair and so on. So you can ask whether any. So there are there are fifty nine new hadrons that have been seen at the LHC and many of. Uh, are these uh, five new tetraquarks. So you can ask if any of these might actually also be uh, coming from something strange, something from the dark side. Okay. So another caveat uh, that needs to be talked about here is that even uh, so that is that we don't have a first principles understanding of, of hadronization. So what all Monte Carlo codes like Pythia and so on do is that they rely on certain um, empirical parameterization of the different flavors of hadrons that might come out and so on. So uh, so that is uh, a big gap. So we don't really know what hadronization in the dark sector would look like. Uh, we don't have an obvious way of calculating it. And so we need to really uh, try and be, uh, try and bracket all possible phenomenological possibilities to see everything that is possible. So there are other ideas uh, out there. So, so mainly, uh, so this was all I had to say about uh, about the dark sector. So I just want to give you a few more ideas of what these LLP things can do uh, in regards to dark matter. So uh, there are other uh, non-thermal dark matter ideas, and one of them is where the mediator is actually lighter than dark matter. So this uh, often does not work for freeze out because it doesn't give you uh, because the cross section is essentially off annihilation is too small, so it, it never figured out in the freeze out calculations, but you can do it with non-thermal cases. Uh, and if you have this light mediator, then you can probe it in standard model meson decays. So for example, you can look at decays of uh, B mesons and K mesons. And if this guy is long lived, uh, then uh, it looks basically like, uh, like an invisible particle has left. And you can use uh, these searches from NA62, for example, or upcoming searches from Bell to, uh, to find out what, what the exclusions are. So I, uh, since we're out of time, I won't go into the details of any of these. Uh, so there are many more ideas that need to be explored. So you need to explore different kind of search strategies like kink tracks or uh, new triggers for, for soft products and so on. Uh, and lo uh, lots more things that need to be done. Uh, let me skip this since we are running out of time. Uh, the other thing that I also want to say is that dark matter is not the only reason to have long-lived particles, but you can have long-lived particles from other motivations as well. So for example, there are some models for neutrino mass uh, that have this heavy uh, heavy neutrinos that come in. So, they are, so these kinds of models are have been categorized under this heavy neutral lepton category. Uh, and they uh, also give certain specific signatures that you can look for at the LHC. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so we've finished run two and uh, run three was supposed to start this year, but of course has been pushed back because of the pandemic. Uh, but we should prepare for the upcoming run. And in particular, in the context of these long lived uh, particle searches, there is this new working group, which is trying to determine a lot of uh, lot of working directions for run three. So one of the things that we've been doing is uh, trying to uh, collect all possible uh, trigger ideas of what kind of new triggers we can use to see dark showers or to see soft, uh, soft objects. Uh, the document is pretty much almost ready. It will be a CERN yellow report and it's uh, we are currently incorporating final comments before it can be published. There's a heavy neutral leptons uh, subgroup that is working on improving Monte Carlo 
uh, description of these models. Uh, there's uh, an effort to collect all kinds of long-lived particles, uh, uh, long-lived particle models so that will form benchmarks that any of the experiments can use for their searches. And of course, since so many of uh, long-lived particle models come from dark matter motivations, uh, we also foresee a collaboration with the dark matter working group. So if, uh, if anyone is interested in working on LLPs, uh, you can go look at our website or subscribe to the mailing list uh, to stay on top of what new workshops uh, are upcoming and so on. Okay. Uh, right. So, okay, so this is pretty much all I wanted to say about LLPs and I just wanted to uh, <laughs> advertise uh, some recent work that will come out hopefully tomorrow or maybe at most uh, the day after with, uh, uh, with Disha and Amol. Uh, both people, who, uh, both of them, who people here know well, and this had to do with just answering the question: Has the LHC seen something new? So there is uh, uh, an anomalous observation in the decay of B mesons in a particular uh, decay mode, and we have a nice model that explains that and has some nice properties. And uh, again, uh, since we are out of time, I won't go into the details, but uh, only say that this is a very falsifiable model. So often uh, you can write down a model and the only re uh, result of LHC search is that you push the mass limits higher and higher. Uh, but this model is particularly nice in that all of the relevant uh, parameter space can be probed at the LHC uh, in, in, those, in the near future. So it's a very falsifiable model and hopefully we will see some positive signatures soon. Okay, so okay, so I'll just uh, summarize then. Uh, I hope I convinced you that uh, there are many motivations to look for long-lived particles, and in particular, uh, if, uh, if you want to have the right dark matter density, you naturally predict long-lived particles, and you can look for them in track searches or displaced lepton or jet searches. And there is a lot of new activity that is going on in designing, testing, and uh, uh, designing and testing these searches. Okay? There are many gaps that still remain, and we have to keep working on it. Uh, and yeah, I'll end here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nishita. Uh, so yeah, we are almost on time. So maybe we can have a few more questions. So uh, I have one. Uh, uh, so one of your earlier blocks was uh, called uh, weird meson decays. Mm -hmm. And I understood that you touched upon the decays of weird mesons. Uh, yeah. But uh, what about uh, weird mesons of, sorry weird, sorry, weird decays of known mesons? Yeah. So uh, they give some uh, contribution. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So, there, so, so weird decays of, Okay, so, so there are two things here, right? So first you need to identify what decay particles you want to look for. So ideally what you would do is you would make, uh, uh, you would make uh, essentially all possible combinations of all possible mesons that you see uh, and try to see if there is some resonance structure. So, okay, so let, let me be more concrete. So how was this guy here, the four charm state discovered? So it is basically a resonance in the J psi, J psi, spectrum right and each j psi is not a fundamental particle by itself but it is also a resonant peak in the mu mu spectrum so the way to find this guy was to first uh, find two j psi's by looking at the mu which is in the right uh, mass and then combining them so basically this is a very hard uh, hard problem right because you want to basically combine all possible particles in all possible ways so it's not obvious how to do this in a in a systematic way so if you have weird decay of a meson uh, then what what that would mean is that you would for some reason have uh, decided to look at resonances with those weird objects uh, with no motivation uh, beforehand so unless you knew that there was something like this to be seen uh, you would not even go there at least given the amount of things that we have to do so that i see as a as a as an obvious problem so yeah i i hope i've answered a bit of your question yeah no i was i was trying to lead towards uh seeing whether these scenarios uh, 
uh, offer uh, some extra DK channels for hmm. you know, let's say B Maison systems or D Maison systems. Yes, so then again, that would depend on on the specifics of your underlying model. So in this case, it's not super interesting uh, unless you have uh, new mediators that somehow change uh, change your uh, uh, your DK modes in some sense. But if it uh, and the other possibility is so it's, it's not so this is a slightly different model but the other possibility is having these kind of invisible decays so you have b to k plus invisible or k to pi plus invisible or or just x something that we don't know what it is mm -hmm. so yeah so that is one another possible way of going about it so k to pi plus invisible of course uh, currently there are measurements from yeah yeah or yeah yeah yes yeah, yeah. this is the na 62 one yeah yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah. So you have to you have to think a little bit harder about uh, about what weirdness can happen before you hmm. you make a comment on that. Okay. Uh, anyone else has question? Um, Nishita, you said uh, it's. Um, somewhat concocted and not favorable for other physics for these uh, mediator particles to have uh, this uh, non-zero charge in both quark and uh, this hidden dark matter sector. Uh, why is that? I mean, what are the physics that runs into problem? Uh, there, there is no problem, obviously, because otherwise you would not write this down at all. But there's also nothing that motivates this. So the only thing that has motivated well, there are this two gauge groups and it's, it should be obvious that there will be some things okay. which will be charged under both. Okay, so yeah, all right. So I then mean, yeah. what motivated okay. quarks to have you know no, no, I, charges? I, yeah, I agree, but I I just meant that it is slightly concocted in the sense that okay. So if you have uh if you have a new gauge symmetry, then the corresponding gauge boson is kind of obvious. If you want some uh you want to give masses to the fermions, then you, some kind of scalar is obvious. So in, in that sense, uh, in, in that sense, I meant uh, both these leptoquarks and these kinds of scalars are sort of artificial. It's the, the only reason is why not? There is no, uh, there is no specific motivation for them in the sense that it does this physics job. Okay. Okay, it seems uh, we don't have any more questions. So last time, Nishita, uh, you can unmute your mic or you can use the reaction window. Thanks. Thank you, Nishita.